Hello ladies and gentlemen, once again, this is Jeremy Smith. As you guys know, we recently took a look at Nikon's new mirrorless model, the Z5. I was very excited about that camera because we've never seen a full frame model in that price point with that feature set before. So it was a very, very big deal and I was talking about how it was a bigger deal than Nikon's uh, higher end models. But in all the full frame hype, I forgot about another camera that Nikon makes called the Z50. And the Z50 is something that I think is actually a better option for many people. Why does a full frame camera snob like me say such things? Uh, why do I shower this uh, crop sensor body with so much praise? Stay tuned and we'll go into this in more detail. Taking a closer look at the Nikon Z50, you guys will notice that it bears a strong resemblance to its bigger siblings, the Z6 and Z7, as well as Z62 and Z72. I think this is actually a very, very good thing, and it kind of ties Nikon's mirrorless ecosystem together. Another really big thing that ties Nikon's mirrorless ecosystem together is something that Nikon, as well as Sony, have done the best with. Canon, eh, not so much. And that is using the same lens mount across their mirrorless cameras. So just like this camera's bigger siblings, even though this is an APS-C size center, it shares the exact same Z mount as its full frame can. And that allows users a nice upgrade path. So if you start off with this camera, as long as you buy lenses that are not uh, DX flavor Z mount lenses, you can actually continue to transition those two full frame camera bodies in the future. And that is, uh, that is an excellent choice on Nikon's part. Now, guys, you might know that I am a full frame, uh, I'm a bit of a full frame snob, but the truth of the matter is, for around the same price point, this camera does give us a lot of things that the Nikon Z5 does not. And so, all the camera manufacturers have pushed towards uh, full frame mirrorless, but uh, crop sensor mirrorless cameras still have a really big advantage. And one of the biggest advantages that we see on this one is the fact that we have much greater shooting speed. So the Nikon Z5 that we took a look at not long ago, the biggest downside is if you're doing any type of action photography, it tops out at like four frames per second. This camera on the other hand can shoot much, much faster. So if we go in here and look at our drive mode, if I go over to something like the continuous extended, this guy shoots much, much faster. <laughs> um, also, if you happen to be like a wildlife shooter or sport shooter or basically anyone that needs a little bit of extra reach out of your lenses, having that 1.5 crop factor actually will help you out there. And for most people, 20 megapixels is still going to be plenty of resolution. Um, I will do, I will rather post a link to some sample photos in the description so you guys can kind of see how this camera performs at high ISO. I shot with this camera quite a bit today. Image quality, as you would expect, is phenomenal. Basically, the 20 megapixel sensor in this camera is very similar to what we have in the Nikon D7500 as well as the Nikon D500. And, those are basically class leading uh, crop sensors. If we go into our menu options here, we can kind of take a look. I'll briefly show you guys the video options. Um, I know a lot of my subscribers feel like I talk way too much about the video these days. I mean, I'm sorry guys. Um, I don't want to talk too much about it, but at the same time, for the majority of us out there, video is a very important part of our camera choice these days. So yeah, you can see that this camera does 4K video up to 30 frames a second. This is pretty standard fare these days. Um, it also can do 1080p at up to 120 frames. Now, the thing that's interesting too about this camera versus a camera like the Nikon Z5 is that we don't have any additional crop factor whenever we're dealing with our 4K video resolutions. So if I come down here, and put this guy in something like 1080p at 24 frames. We'll jump right over into our video modes, which are access with this little toggle right there. 
and I will set it to 16 millimeters. You can see we get a nice wide field view. If I press the menu button again, jump over here, we can then jump into some 4K. And you guys will notice that my field of view doesn't really change. This is an entirely different experience than what we saw in the Nikon Z5, which does have a little bit of a crop factor in 4K. So if you're going to do video um, and you don't want to deal with that crop factor, if you're dealing with a full frame body, you'd have to go all the way up to the Z6 or the Z6 II to not have the crop. But yeah, this camera at around the same price point as the Z5, actually a bit less, uh, at least when they're not on sale, this is going to be the better option for you if you don't want to deal with that crop factor. Another interesting thing about the video on this camera is the screen on the camera. So if you are a vlogger type, um, I'm not a vlogger, but um, if you are, you actually can go in and do this. Um, I'll show you guys a little bit better view of this. I went out earlier today and I kind of pretended to be a vlogger. But uh, yeah, you do have that flip down screen. So I'll kind of show you guys how that works uh, here as well. Okay, so I remembered what this microphone is called. It's uh, the Rode VideoMic Micro. We are filming with it now. Notice that right now my face just lined up. That's because the camera actually found my face. And as soon as it does that, the auto exposure system's uh, kicking up the ISO and giving me a nice exposure on my face. So it does a really good job of that. Now, I'm not a vlogger. I'm not going to pretend to be a vlogger. But I just wanted to give you guys a brief impression of how this works out. Having the microphone uh, mounted up at the top here on the hot shoe and having the screen down below means that, well, with the screen, if it were facing up, like on the Sony's, we would get basically our microphone blocks, but with it on the bottom, that is not the case. However, what we do have blocked uh, is the tripod socket. So if you get yourself one of those cute little selfie sticks, it's not gonna work out quite as well unless you buy this little adapter gadget that Nikon kind of commission small rigs make. And the car is on the interstate very loud. Anyways, uh, but yes, Nikon, they, they commission small rigs to make this little bracket that allows you to relocate the tripod socket. So that can be handy. Anyways, that's enough of the video discussion for now. Um, if you guys want to see how this camera handles vlogging uh, or other things like that, let me know in the comments and I can always make another video. Looking at some other things on this camera though, uh, we'll go ahead and just put it over to still image mode now. I'll look at some other cam things on this camera. Control wise, there's lots of things here I'd like to comment on. This camera, just like every, just like basically all the newer Nikons, does have an ISO button right up here at the top. Um, I think the Nikon D500 and D850 were the first Nikon cameras to get this. And we've basically seen it on everything since then. And uh, I think that's great because it's very easy to change ISO whenever you're shooting. So you can press there and rotate the back wheel to change that manual setting. Now, because this is more of an entry level camera technically, or at least Nikon views it that way, uh, compared to the Z5, this one has an automatic mode just like the Z5 does, but it also has some scene modes. So whenever you go into the scene mode position here on the dial or the SCN as it's labeled as uh, an abbreviation, you go there, then you just rotate this top command wheel. And as you do that, that actually allows you to go between all of your different scenes right here. So basically, you know, you don't have this very, very cluttered dial where you're trying to figure out all these hieroglyphics, <laughs> uh, as I call them. You basically can get a nice little description um, and kind of see on screen what this is all about. So as you go between landscape and portrait and whatnot, you can see everything happening there. So that's very nice. And this is going to be a good thing for people that are just starting out. Um, you also have some customizable user banks. There's a U1 and U2 here. So if you want to go in and sort of customize um, if you want to customize your different settings, it's a good thing. Um, basically, you can go in and and essentially make your own scene mode. So you could customize your manual settings, your white balance, focus modes, etc., and save them to these user banks. So these are really cool. I'll go back over to manual for now. And you guys will notice that <clears throat> we have our rear wheel here, which changes our shutter speed, which is just like 
pretty much every Nikon since for ever. Um, I have I have a Nikon F100 film camera that had this same layout. So if you've been using Nikon a while, you'll no doubt feel at home uh, with this layout. And then we have our front command wheel up here, and that is going to be your aperture setting. So it's all nicely laid out. Now, if you're in here and you're changing your ISO like this, and you want to jump over into auto ISO, you press and hold that button. But instead of rotating this back down with your thumb, like I'm doing right now, you basically press the ISO button and you rotate the front wheel, which takes a little bit of finger gymnastics, um, but it does work. So whenever you do that, usually I like to reach around with uh, my middle finger here. And that allows me to toggle back and forth between auto, ISO, on, and off. So it works out very, very well. As far as other controls on the camera, you have your, you have not only one FN button, but you have two FN buttons. Uh, <laughs> anyways, um, the top one is going to be for your white balance. So if you press and hold it, that allows you to rotate the back wheel here. By the way, Nikon, they like to call this the main command wheel and the front one, they like to call it the sub command wheel. I usually just call them the front and back wheel, but you basically press and hold that and uh, you rotate this back wheel. And as you rotate this back wheel, you can see we're going through all of our white balance presets. If I hold down the lower one, function two, function two is going to be all about focus. Press and hold that guy. If you rotate the back wheel here, you're changing your focus drive mode. So you can go between continuous focus, uh, manual focus, auto, which basically automatically you know detects whether or not it should be continuously focusing or locking the focus. And then you have AFS for single. And um, I don't know guys, write me in the comments below if you'd like to hear me talk about Nikon's focus modes in more detail. Anyways, if you press and hold that same function button, and rotate the uh, front wheel here, it goes between the different area modes. So that allows you to go in here and change how large that focus area is. And if you want to do something like the face and eye detection, you have to be over in this one here, which is the auto area. So that's the one that's the sort of like filled in box there. So I'll go ahead and show you guys how that works. Um, oh yes, and I usually like to use the face and eye detection in combination with AFC. So let's go ahead and give uh, I'll go ahead and give you guys a quick little look at that too. The thing I love about Nikon's eye autofocus is that whenever you bring up the camera, you guys can notice that we do get a nice indicator box to let us know where the eyes are. But I like how you can quickly toggle back and forth left and right. This is something that we're starting to see on Canon as well, and um, I hope we see it on Sony soon too. But yeah, you can see how it's very easy to toggle back and forth between the eyes. And as I mentioned, in order to get eye autofocus working, we do have it over on the auto area mode, and it works best on AFC, so that way you can continue to have everything track. So yeah, it basically works just like all of Nikon's other models. Okay, so a couple more things about the controls that I noticed. Um, if you guys have ever used like the Nikon, um, any of the higher end Nikon Z models, you might be a little bit confused whenever you first pick up this camera just because a lot of the buttons you expect to be the same or not. Um, I kept constantly thinking these two buttons were zoom in and zoom out, just like on the higher end models, but they are not. So this one is a little bit different in the sense that a lot of those controls are on this side panel here. So you have your zoom in and zoom out just like this. And then you have the display button down here. And um, so I'll show you that one if I go over here. So you can see as I hit display, it's kind of cycling through different views like that. This was not really a big deal for me, um, except for the display button. Uh, now, I realize that Nikon did this because this body is quite a bit smaller than the higher end Z models, so I get it. But I think they could have just left the display button right here at least, um, just like it is on the upper end Z models. The reason why I say this is because whenever you are looking at the back screen, and you tap on this display button, you can actually cycle through all the views here on screen. But this same display button cycles through the views independently whenever you're looking through the electronic viewfinder. 
it is really hard when you're looking through this EVF to come down here and kind of grope around and find the little area of the touchscreen where the display is and actually hit that and cycle through these same views when you're in the viewfinder. So that was my big gripe about this layout. But um, these buttons I did get used to over time. If we take a look at the side of the camera here, you'll notice that we have some connections. Unfortunately, not USB-C on this one, um, but the upside is we do have the ability to charge the camera through this uh, micro uh, USB 2.0 connection. Uh, just below that, we have our micro HDMI, and then we do have our microphone jack right here. And yeah, if you've watched this channel for a while, you know I'm very picky about these doors. They're decent, you know. They uh, they get the job done. Not the best, not the worst. Pretty pretty solid there. If you look down here at the bottom, this is where our battery compartment is. This is a little bit different for Nikon, um, but the memory card is actually located in here as well. So a little bit of a different thing to have that down here with our battery. Yeah, so that's how that works out. All in all, pretty solid camera. Uh, we don't have dual card slots on this one, unfortunately. I would say that that's pretty par for the course for this range of camera. Uh, this is something that's pretty pretty identical to uh, all the Sony's in this range, like for example, the A6400 or A6600. And it's also the same thing on many of the DSLRs too, like the D7500, which this camera shares lots of bits with. It also has been uh, sort of downgraded to a uh, single card slot. So I think that for this level of user, for the most part, it's going to work out okay. This is about it for this one, guys. I'm going to link all the sample photos in the description below so you can actually download some raw files as well as look at the high res JPEGs. Definitely write me in the comments if there's anything else you'd like to see on this camera. And there's absolutely no reason why that we can't revisit it in the future. Anyways, guys, until next time, uh, don't forget to subscribe and uh, hit the thumbs up button if you really enjoyed this video. Until next time, guys, this is Jeremy Smith, signing off.